and welcome to the third program in our five-part series of Consciousness Central 2018, coming from the Science of Consciousness Conference here in beautiful Tucson, Arizona. I'm your host, Nick Day, and in today's show we have two really great interviews not to be missed, talking about psychedelic research and connectome harmonics with Selene Atasoy, and whether consciousness can ever be computational with Yosha Bach. And of course, we have our daily plenary roundup with Conference Executive Director Stuart Hameroff. All this and more on today's Consciousness Central. So I would like to welcome back to Consciousness Central, Selene Atasoy. Selene is a, tell us, where you are and what you do, Selene. Yeah, I have recently moved to the University of Oxford, uh, to the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, I'm researching on, um, on consciousness and its altered states, and we will also start looking into psychiatric disorders and their neural correlates um, using, using rather the, the harmonic method that I've been working on, the connectome harmonics. We, we talked to you two years ago, and since mm -hmm. then you've uh, moved into a very um, rather compelling and fascinating field. Mm -hmm. That's the field of psychedelic research. Uh, you are in collaboration with uh, Robin Carhart Harris, who is yes, obviously yeah. one of the leading researchers at the moment mm -hmm. in the UK and globally. Um, so, what, uh, in your experience and coming from your perspective, what can we learn about um, well neuroscience and mm -hmm. consciousness from psychedelic from research? Yeah. Actually, yeah, uh, it's, it was very coincidental. It is um, the way we started collaborating uh, with with Robin Carhart Harris and his group. Um, it was uh, we received a third party email actually saying, "Why don't you guys uh, apply this method to this type of data set, which would be very interesting?" And we thought it would be very interesting to look at. So um, I think psychedelics really uh, give us the opportunity to, to study uh, altered states of consciousness in a, in a controlled way. So because you, um, they involve kind of this pharmacological changes um, which we then measure in neural activity and using various different types of techniques we can look at, um, at their effect and how it matches actually um, the subjective experience of the participants. That was maybe the most interesting uh, part of our study that we did find some, um, some signatures in neural activity which um, significantly correlated with the intensity of certain experiences such as ego dissolution or emotional arousal or uh, positive mood. That was quite encouraging to see that it's not only they're finding some um, interesting aspects in brain activity, but they have a meaning in, in participants' experiences in the psychedelic state. You, you um, have proposed a system or a model called the Harmonic Connectome, is that correct? Connectome Harmonics. Con yes, Connectome. Yeah, Almost yeah, yeah. There. So it's actually, I would say, um, I would say it's a new representation for, for any kind of functional neuroimaging data. Um, it's, it's, we call it, in a way, it's a harmonic language to describe your brain activity. And the only thing we do is actually we take the fMRI data and instead of um, doing a, a standard analysis on it, we change into this harmonic language or harmonic representation. And then we start looking at the differences between placebo and, uh, and LSD-induced psychedelic state um, using this harmonic language. And it turns out that uh, that really helps us to extract some characteristic signatures of this state, which is, um, yeah, which was quite encouraging to also look for uh, other data sets. And so do you, do you get kind of a signature with different sort of neurological activity? So for example, LSD might be one signature, maybe a meditation yes, would yeah. be, a, is that, do yeah. you see similarities and differences say between meditators and people yeah. who are taking psychedelics? No, I'm glad you asked that actually because we were very uh, surprised to see similarities. So we, uh, that's still an ongoing uh, study, uh, but the data collection part is finished and we have looked at the data um, for, and so we looked for two different groups, experienced meditators and um, I 
think they were really experienced in the sense the average uh, hours of experience was m around, uh, I believe, 8,000. Um, and then we had a control group which was naive, um, no experience in meditation. And then we looked at the fMRI data of both groups during mindfulness meditation and resting state. And when we look at the experienced meditator group in uh, mindfulness meditation, we observe very similar effects in the brain as we do in the LSD induced state. I mean, there are of course differences as well. Um, so we did find for both data sets, for instance, uh, that it was actually um, increasing the power of, of all of the connectome harmonics. So that was kind of a bit of a surprise to see that when you actually silence the mind, it increases the uh, power and energy of, of brain activity. And we did see similar type of um, frequency spec uh, specific alterations in the brain. Um, in both cases, this more or less the same range of connectome harmonics were more active in meditation as well as in, in the psychedelic state. One difference was that psychedelics in, in the psychedelic state, we did find a kind of a suppression in a certain frequency range of these harmonics, which we didn't find in meditation. And, um, but the, the overlap was really striking to see, uh, which was unexpected. How do you make these measurements? Is it fMRI or...? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so, so far uh, we have only looked at fMRI data using this technique. Um, yeah, so we take the fMRI data and change to the harmonic representation, change the language and then do our analysis in that space. But technically it's also applicable to um, other functional neuroimaging data sets such as MEG which we are excited to apply. And I assume your test subjects uh, spend their some time on, on acid. In an MRI machine, is this what's going on? Well, actually, we were the lucky ones just to get the data sets ready for us ah, to okay. look at. Okay. So <laughs> it was uh, it was Robin Carhartaris and his group right. who collected the data. Uh, but uh, yes, in to answer the question, actually, yeah, the subjects yeah. are tripping yeah. in the scanner. So um, looking ahead a little bit and where you can how you can apply this and where it can go next mm -hmm. what's uh, what, what would you like to see happen yes we are very very excited to apply um, the same technique the same method to look at um, data sets coming from uh, psychiatric patients so the f the first that we are planning uh, to look at is actually a large uh, depression data set and PTSD post traumatic stress disorder um, and see if, if that's going to give us any kind of uh, meaningful information now that we can compare uh, different, different states of consciousness such as meditation, uh, psychedelic state and we also looked at the sleep data sets where we found um, exact opposite type of signatures, connectome harmonic signatures um, in deep sleep as compared to the psychedelic state. So uh, we are very, very eager to uh, start looking at, at psychiatric disorders as well with, uh, with this method. All right, Selena Atasoy, thank you very, very much for coming back. We thank hope we'll you. see you again thank in the you future. And you'll become a regular on Consciousness uh, we'll Central see, every yeah, time with see, exciting news so. stuff. Thank you so much. All right, thanks. with Mr. Charles Nosser, who's from the U of A here in Tucson, and his colleague is Mr. Ad van der Gevel yeah, yes. from the Netherlands. We love the Netherlands, of course. And the challenge I've given to them, or certainly Mr. Uh, Mr. Gevel here, van der Gevel, is to describe his poster, which has a lot of words, in about one minute. So. so. Okay. Well, what we did was applying the first the principles of economics. Okay? Economics consists of micro and macro. Macro concerns broad categories, okay, like inflation, like rates of interest, uh, and, uh, unemployment, etc. And uh, micro concerns 
uh, rational producer and rational consumer surplus. Not only con surplus, but behavior, okay? That's one thing. That the, just basic principles of economics. We try to, that's how we started, because a lot of ignorance is being there, okay? Second, what we try to do is to find out whether or not the principles of economics can be applied to quantum economics, to quantum physics and other, the other way around, can the principles of quantum physics be applied to economics. Now, what's the lesson we learned? The lesson we learned was that there are many similarities and there are many differences between the two, okay? And that's if, actually the final conclusion. But we can work together, we can integrate quantum physics in economics and that is the most beautiful conclusion you can, you can, we could draw okay okay so one quick question it begs to answer so um are you using schrodinger equations so uh, is it that the that the, the the euro is both in my pocket and not in my pocket well if you uh, are not uh, uh, Betting, okay, too much. Then, it, then, it's, then, then, then you can uh, use it for consumption and production, and that's the most useful things you can do. Okay, you might save it or invest. Okay, that's th th those are the two possibilities. Excellent, excellent. So, um, and so, should economists around the world now uh, go to uh, you know go and study physics and then apply you know quantum physics and then yes, apply that? Yes. That's what yes, this yes. is what you're saying. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's and the other way around too. Okay. But physics, phys physicians might uh, learn quite a lot from economics too. Okay. Uh, uh, we like the interdisciplinary approach yeah, you're exactly, taking. Exactly, so, exactly. okay. Well, thank you very much for showing us your post. Okay. 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 And what's your name, please? Uh, Dr. Kanta Arora. I have tried to explain. Firstly, I have brought the up-to-date history of revolution, uh, revolutions at the different levels of consciousness, the mystic sounds emanating itself in the human form. So I uh, intend to con conclude that as when air is regulated in the musical instruments, it gives different sound. Similarly, when prana means air again, prana means air, when it is regulated in, in uh, human form, uh, human form through yoga it gives different experience of spirituality to the different human beings that is the uh, basic uh, thing so this gives eastern and western both side of uh, the picture it, this is not only these are the east saints who had uh, uh, actually experienced all these things and these are the Upanishads and uh, uh, the uh, basic literature which originated for and uh, explains the mystic sounds. So mystic sounds, these are emanating in human form of it itself. These are unstuck melodies, melodies, and one can experience these sounds through deep absorption within the human form itself. Thank you so much for talking to us this evening. <laughs>so our next guest on consciousness central would like to welcome back for um, a second appearance yosha bach uh, uh, yosha is at uh, harvard you're a scientist um, and uh, always has uh, perspectives that go beyond um, all the boundaries we've ever invented for ourselves yosha welcome thank you so much for coming back Thanks so um, something that roger penrose talks about the um, the idea that consciousness is non-computational that somehow it's beyond algorithms and you have uh, some kind of rebuttal or some kind of something to add to that. So what is your position on computational consciousness? I think that um, Roger's position and the position of most people that start looking when they go beyond perception is the experience of an essence. There is some truth that animates us and that animates reality. And we cannot really grasp that, but we can point at it. And our perception and um, imagination, reasoning, science, and so on, is able to touch the surface of this somehow, but it can never really get at it, right? This is a very strong, very powerful intuition. And when you look at the hermeneutical fields, like literature and so on, and a lot of philosophy, it access these things by reference. You point at this. You know everybody has access to this substance, to this essence. So you can deal with it by referring to it. And science is different. Science tries to start with an empty table and then it builds a structure on that empty table in a formal language with formal 
models that you can completely criticize that are entirely self-contained, but it's removed from that essence. It's very difficult to make a connection between this reality and this deeper reality that we experience and feel and uh, have the strong intuition about, and the thing that we do in the science that is formal and self-contained uh, and mathematical and abstract, right? And most of the sciences uh, don't actually try to make that connection anymore. So many of the people that work in the lab or that work uh, in, in the theoretical field don't really think about how what they're uh, coming up with in terms of theory does relate to their experience. And this creates a gap and it's also something that this conference, the Science of Consciousness conference, is trying to enter in, in this gap that is being left by the sciences. It's something that's more like a gap of the Science of Consciousness conference in a way, right? <laughs> And, um, and there's something to this because it has integrity if you, if you see it like this. And uh, there's also a lot of scientific work, but also a lot of this is basically filling into this gap between science and this experience of reality. Now, it turns out, I think, that this experience that we have is actually what our brain is doing. This universe that we experience is a dream generated by our brain, I think. It's generated in the neocortex, the same circuitry that produces dreams at night produces a dream during the day. And that dream is meant to explain the data, that the patterns on your retina, on your cochlea, and so on, right? This is, in some sense, what our brain is doing. And it's a pretty complicated thing, what that is doing. You don't know what it's doing. It's very hard to explore. And in some sense, when you have knowledge about what our, your mind is doing, it's second order knowledge, it's knowledge about how these models are being generated. Imagine you have a toddler sitting on the floor, and this toddler folds a piece of paper and pushes a pen through it. What that toddler is doing is she is proving theorems about embedded surfaces in a Euclidean three-dimensional space. It's pretty complicated stuff. <laughs> and the toddler doesn't have a language to talk about it. And mathematicians only later reverse engineer what our brain is actually doing when we make these explorations. So um, my take is that this essence is not something that is outside of us. It's something that is actually being generated in our brain. But it's very hard to understand what it is. To be in a particular state doesn't mean that you know that you are in that state. And we try to make models of that, right? So, but if you have this impression that what your brain is doing is actually what, the, what reality is, and it's more than science can do, you now try to look for a way to do something that is not computational, that is different than our formal mathematical computational languages. And when Roger hopes that we can find something or he can find something that is more than what computation is, that's very difficult because even quantum mechanics, it's basically the universe is a big table of numbers. Then a, a, a function comes along the Hamiltonian, it changes it into the next state, into the next table of numbers. That's computational. Computation is a very general term. It just means regular state change. Something is moving in a not completely random fashion along and evolving. And information is just difference. It's nothing fancy. It's really just difference, the most elementary thing we get from the universe. So how can you get more elementary than that? And if something like this exists, and it's possible maybe that it exists, and I don't have high confidence that it does, it would be something like metacomputation, something outside of the computation, a deeper reality that can produce computation, but itself cannot be captured by computation. OK, but then. <clears throat> Does that not beg the question, well, when we talk about consciousness, we're talking about a sort of a sense of subjective experience. It feels and it has a completely different phenomenal experience to the material world and the measurement, to the world of measurements and predictions and mathematics. Is something arising in this sense of sentience, awareness, experience? So. Are you, are you addressing that, or are, are you more addressing the sort of the, the challenge to mathematics or the challenge to science? Uh, at a deeper level, I'm addressing this because I'm in this field because I want to understand how this works. How is it that this universe is happening to us, right? This is the most profound question that we tend to ask ourselves if we go into profound questions because we have that quirk, right? right. So uh, this is actually what I'm interested in. How is it possible that this arises? And the best solution I've come up so far is that the self this is something that a story that our brain is telling itself. It's a story that is, is like a novel, but it's not written in words. It's written in a much wider language, a computational language, but one that gives you the components of perception. And in some sense, the universe is happening to you in the same way as the universe is happening to the character in a George R.R. R. Martin novel. 
So um, this character might stand on this hill and look down on the city, and it's all written into that story. And then they make a plan to go into that city and uh, maybe capture it if it's a, a war scene or whatever, and uh, imagine what, what it's going to be like, and then react to the pain and pleasure that the world is doing to them. And it's all happening in that story. It's a dream generated by the brain to tell itself a story from which it can learn and make plans and evaluate its relationship to the outer universe. So when we try to explore the nature of this reality and our own reality, what we figure out at some point is that it has a dreamlike structure. And I think this is the big discovery of the idealist philosophers, especially in the Eastern religions. If you look at the um, philosophies of the East, they are idealists. They believe that this universe essentially is a dream. And you and me are characters in that dream. And that dream is generated by a mind that exists on a higher plane of existence, right? Right. And Western science is exploring that higher plane of existence. Yes. And the best thing that Western science has come up with to explain what goes on that higher plane of existence is that it's a physical universe with hairless primates shambling around and going about their business. And in the skulls of those hairless primates, there are complicated probabilistic biocomputers, mm -hmm. and they have the capacity to generate dreams. And so the big leap is we have to understand we are, don't have access to the physical universe, right? It doesn't fit through our nerves. What comes in through our nerves are just electrical impulses that code for differences in, that we measure, right? And then your brain tries to generate a story from this and a dynamic, colorful world. And this is simulation is what we experience, that we find ourselves in. So in a sense, <clears throat> okay, as best we can use language and words and labels, consciousness is primary and matter is an epiphenomenon of consciousness. Well, yes and no. Um, it depends on which stance you're taking. Inside of the dream, everything is just part of the dream, including your uh, scientific model of the world. But not every system is able to produce dreams. And what AI is exploring is what preconditions would a system need to fulfill to be able to produce dreams. And that's, in some sense, a mathematical question. It's something that you can answer a priori by constructing the possibilities from the ground up. So once we understand the idea of a computational automaton, a thing that you can make um, in such a way that it can perform particular state changes more than others, you can direct it to produce certain things. And at some point you can ask yourself, what kind of system is capable of dreaming? And how would such a system come into existence? And evolution is clearly a mechanism that is a very good candidate for bringing such things into existence. And brains are good candidates for having the necessary computational structure for producing such dreams. Right? right? So in this sense, uh, it's a good model of what could be real. We can, of course, not know what's real because we don't have access to the ground truth. But the idea that this universe does have a ground truth makes, gives you very good predictions. Yasha, thank you so much, man. <laughs>
what was the original idea for creating a group? Where, where did that come from? Group. So uh, the three of us, the three, the two stilters and I started hula hooping. I was in graduate school in astronomy and it was very stressful and I decided I needed a stress reliever and so I started hula hooping. And that turned one thing turned into one another, thing to another. <laughs> and I started a hula hoop performance troupe, and then our performance troupe just started meeting other circus folk, and awesome. turned into this very grassroots. Uh -huh. So was now this okay? Yeah. So was this the product of like one enchanted evening when everyone was sitting around going, you know, we need to just bring this together and cover ourselves with little blinky lights? Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just covered in play at late night. at night. Yeah. <laughs> you you were covered in okay. You say that again. We were covered in playa dust and we just came up with this idea. <laughs> okay, so now I should explain for anybody who might not know this, playa dust is a very specific term, which means that everybody was at Burning Man, yeah. the, the Black Rock Desert in Nevada. And uh, the dust there is very specific, it has magic qualities. Stardust. Um, stardust. It, it's stardust. It's stardust. <laughs> so um, now tonight's performance was called? Exist. Exist. We filmed some of it. We'll use it in our clip. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit. Uh, what's the what's the story here going on? In well, I mean, I remember first discussing it when we were writing two separate grants, but we were like sitting at my kitchen table writing these two grants together, different arts grants. Mm -hmm. And as and as she dropped out of grad school, as well finished grad school, but then mm -hmm. quit teaching to pursue circus full time, and then she was kind of coming back around to astronomy again. So. As we were writing these grants, you know, she came up with this idea for this kind of journey through the cosmos, blending her two loves, astronomy mm -hmm. and circus. Am I giving yeah, this, doing exactly. this justice? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yes, and using art as a vehicle to teach about science. Thank you so much, guys. It's been Thank a real you. pleasure. Yes, say a few words. I, do. You know, I just want to give another shout out to Tucson, you know, where we're from. We've been building this project in just like a year, but we've been collaborating for about eight years. So we've really come a long way, and it's just a pleasure to have shared it with so many great yeah. people. Thank you so much. Thank this you. is a great the conference. conference. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Yes, amazing. it is a great conference. This is a lot of fun, a lot of fun. All right, well, we'll see you on the playa and yeah, yeah. see you somewhere in the cosmos. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>so now on consciousness central my great pleasure to introduce three experts in the field and we're looking at today we're talking about at our invisible round table uh, the evolution of life and with it perhaps the evolution of consciousness or we could say was consciousness there all along and life emerged through it some of the questions we'll be discussing i have with me over here stuart kaufman in the middle is here is bruce damer and next to me steen rasmussen so first of all anybody here uh, would anybody like to sort of speculate perhaps the relationship between evolution and consciousness one view and the one that i've kind of skeptically come to is panpsychism that, that consciousness is a feature of the universe which you alluded to nick um, if that's right for example it's possible that quantum variables when they measure one another do so consciously of course we don't know that but, but just suppose it then then uh, consciousness did not arise with life when life happened. It's not a consequence of life. Life arose with consciousness in some sense. So I think that's at least conceivable. I, I have no idea how to prove it, but I think it's conceivable and attractive. Um, so then, uh, let's suppose you take that idea. So you, the protocells that we'll be talking about, because um, we're all passionate about protocells, suppose that they were conscious. Well, they don't have eyes, eyes and nose and, and ears and so on. So consciousness must have evolved in very complex ways um, as evolution has proceeded. So for example, the consciousness of a rat is different from the consciousness of a banana, if bananas are conscious. Um, how has that happened? And this ties into something that I'll just take a few moments and mention. For 2,000 years, people have talked about panpsychism. It's the idea, I mean, one of the struggles is, are, are, are plants conscious? Are rocks conscious? Are we conscious? Are dogs conscious? All of that. We're not the first to wonder about them. There's a very, very old set of questions. If you imagine, just for the moment, that quantum variables can be in some minimal sense conscious, for example, at measurement, um, then we think we're conscious and rocks aren't. Of course, we don't know that. Why not? There must be something to, to quote you, Steen. There must be something deeply physical about what's required for, let me call it, complex consciousness. And nobody knows, and we're not thinking about it. Um, it's not enough to get some raw little bit of consciousness. One has to get the kind of complex consciousness that, for example, we have. 
And I don't know that anybody has thought about it, but it does remind me of the talk last night, forgive me for going on so long, in which, in which, um, in which Noam Chomsky was talking about the ideas two centuries ago that somehow consciousness was the behavior of complex matter. Well, complex consciousness is somehow the behavior of complex matter. You know, and, and what about a rock? And what's the difference in the complexity of the matter? So we just don't know. Bruce, now you're more of a hands-on guy. I have. I'm a hands-on <laughs> guy. So. And you said I've heard you say before that you thought perhaps consciousness is an emergent property. I think you. Yeah. I'm fair in saying that. Yeah, I'm. A, it sounds like we'll be slightly disagreeing somewhat. Slightly, because this. what my entire practice is actually is to go back through the history of the Earth. And I work with NASA sometimes. I'm on the Mars 2020 landing site selection process to try to find life on Mars, or evidence for probably past life on Mars. And this is evidence for past life on Earth, uh, a rock uh, which is infused with the imprint of biology from over 3 billion years ago. So this was collected uh, in northwestern Australia a couple of years ago. And these little ridges here are biofilm deposited sequestered sand grains, creating something called a stromatolite. And for 90% of the history of life on Earth and po possibly exoplanets too, this is po possibly the only biology that is there. And this biology is different, uh, operates on a different principle than, you know, we like to think of gazelles being hunted by lions which is a, a, a strong selection system. This, this biology operates on what's called the consortia model. Everything here is collaborative. So the top layer of the biofilm is absorbing sunlight to feed the bottom layer. And there's a detritus layer that's recycling the community. So there isn't strict competition at all between individuals. There is competition in the level of the virus load that this would carry. But this actually still, believe it or not, the microbial community is still well over 90% of the biomass on the planet because it goes down several miles into the crust. And possibly that's where we would find it on Mars if we could drill. So the point I want to make here is that this is the hard core evidence what the Earth looked like for 90% of its history if you went back before oxygenation in the atmosphere, etc. And what I'm putting forth is that the simplest model for consciousness is to go back to putative ways, mechanical, mechanical philosophy, ways of which uh, the chemical world can go from the pure physics of a cycling pool and gradually lift the functions of biology into existence and then surf entropy and then create this complex world. I think that the, that is the simplest, most you know, uh, uh, easy to actually track with evidence model for what consciousness is. And that my prediction is that consciousness is, no, is nothing more than the collective properties of the booting up of the living world scaled up massively. Stain a few. Yeah, so I uh, considered this. Yeah, no, I certainly, <laughs> I, I'm familiar with, with these uh, lines of thought. and. Um, I think that, uh, first of all, it comes out of this fascination that, that we, we see all this fantastic uh, stuff around us, that we are alive and we can think and reflect and whatnot. And, and uh, sort of in a, in a really s simple way, the way I, I think about um, life and, and also consciousness is that it, it's something that inherent, uh, that's inherently possible due to the way that, that uh, physics uh, is, is made up. And just to give an, sort of a flavor of it, um, I'll give you um, an example. So, uh, but because the, the, I think the key is, and I think this is what both of you alluded to in, in a different ways, is that when you put stuff together in different ways, new things come about. And um, if you just think about uh, water, and then you have uh, molecules um, that, um, that sort of bump around in, in this water, um, uh, then if, if these molecules, if they are oily, uh, you, you can try to put oil in water and you know that, that it separates. Then you can actually have, you can have two different, you can have two different uh, phases. And um, uh, so something happens when you put water and oil together. And the interesting thing is that you get an interface. And at this interface, uh, you can actually uh, define 
um, you can find uh, the notion of something being inside and something being on the outside, which are concepts that doesn't make any sense before you mix these things together. Mm -hmm. Another example is that if you have a, a, a molecule, a, a polymer that's con composed of other molecules and you throw it in water, actually oil, um, if you then, uh, in this one end of this molecule, have a, a polar group or a group that, that likes water more than, than the hydrophobic end, then you can, form, you can form membranes, and it happens all by itself. It's just, it's, it's free energy that, that pushes these things together. And once you have these membranes, uh, they will by themselves form vesicles. And then uh, you have these vesicles, and, and then again, you, you can start to think about uh, permeability, how, how difficult is it that, that measures how difficult it is to get through this membrane. Uh, so, and you, another example is that, um, uh, if you, um, if you just a simple one, if you have a, a, a necklace, a molecule, um, and if you uh, assume, or actually, you can actually have mo molecular uh, uh, necklaces that don't have that, where you don't have any elasticity in the bonds, in the atomic bonds, but you can still measure elasticity if you take uh, if you take uh, laser tweezers and, and and try to stretch this one. It's because there's many many more folded states. And their stretch states, so there will be this entropic force that will uh, enable uh, us to measure elasticity. So that means that when you put things together, emergent things happen. Things that you cannot observe when you look at this thing and you look at that thing, but when you put them together, these new things, uh, these new things come about. And that's how we've done in the lab when we've put piece by piece of molecular, uh, both organics and, and inorganics together. So then we got a metabolic system, we got a container, we got a, uh, an informational system, we got these things to work together. We had to, of course, uh, drive it with energy. So you sort of step by step, we do that because we have to understand what's going on, because we're scientists, we want to sort of understand each step. And then you suddenly get, we, we haven't gotten to, to light quite yet, but many labs are at the verge of being able to do that. And I think that as you continue this process, then at some point you'll get to something that um, um, uh, that will be sort of consciousness at the level of a, of a, of a bacteria, and uh, then maybe at a at a at a tree or at a mouse or whatnot. So there is, I think, it's a matter of, of degrees, in my opinion, um, and that's at least I think that's a very fruitful uh, working hypothesis. And with that, I think let's call it a day. Thank you so much, Stuart Bruce. And Steen for coming and chit-chatting. This has been, I've really enjoyed it. So I hope, I hope everybody else has enjoyed that. Thank you very much for that one. And now let's check in with, once again, with Stuart to talk about plenaries on Thursday. So Stuart, let's, what, what happened? Thursday morning uh, was Physics and Consciousness 1, the first physics session. And uh, this is one of my favorite areas. And the first speaker was Lucian Hardy from the per Perimeter Institute in Waterloo, Ontario. And Lucian's well known in, uh, in, in the foundations of physics and quantum mechanics in particular. And he talked about uh, whether human consciousness could be used to uh, distinguish the uh, Bell inequality experiments, which relates to uh, the observer effect in quantum mechanics. It wasn't exactly the same, but it's been well known since the turn of the 20th century that it appears that quantum systems are continue until observed by a conscious human, that consciousness causes collapse of the wave function. And uh, this goes back to Niels Bohr and uh, Eugene Wigner and John von Neumann, and more recently, uh, people like Henry Stapp and Dave Chalmers, who've, who've uh, suggested that consciousness causes collapse of the wave function. So Lucian uh, came forth with some ideas about, uh, about how this might be happening through the Bell inequalities, which gets uh, a little bit uh, technical. But it was an interesting talk, and he was a very engaging speaker, I thought. He was followed by a, uh, uh, a New Yorker, Robert Alfano, uh, who is a professor at CUNY in electrical engineering and physics. And he's been doing some fascinating experiments with quantum entanglement. You know, the famous EPR experiment that befuddled Einstein. This goes back um, to thought experiment of Einstein where uh, about entanglement. So in quantum physics, if you take two particles like the spin up and spin down uh, electron or, or polarization, 
and uh, and they're in superposition, and, and say two of them, and they have to be opposite. You send one this way and one the other way. It could be 50 or 100 miles away or, or even longer now. And if you make a measurement on this one, quantum mechanics predicted that this one over here would instantaneously collapse to the alternative, that they were somehow connected. And Einstein didn't like this idea because it implied faster than light uh, s signaling uh, between the, the two uh, separated um, entities because it was instantaneous. And uh, so he, he called the spooky action at a distance, didn't think it was possible. He came up with the uh, thought experiment with Podolsky and Rosen, EPR, so it's a famous EPR experiment. So, um, uh, but nonetheless, in, the, in 1986, it was proven that it's true. And since then, this entanglement has been used in quantum communication, quantum uh, teleportation, quantum cryptography, and so forth, and it works over and over again. It's a good way to, uh, for uh, security and that sort of thing. Anyway, um, Alfano, uh, did some very interesting experiments of doing these EPR experiments in which one of the photon branches goes through a brain. So what he did was his group, they took a brain out of a mouse and had one of the, so the beams are split uh, or the beams go in a different direction. Uh, one of them goes through the mouse's brain and over here and then a, a measurement is made. And sure enough, uh, the entanglement holds uh, even after one of the beam goes through the, um, the mouse brain, which is no longer alive, but it's kept in uh, reasonable condition. Now, what was really interesting was that if the uh, brain dried out, if it got a little dehydrated and wasn't feeling so well, you might think, the entanglement was diminished markedly. So the degree of entanglement was related to the health of the tissue. So I've been asking him, and he said he would do it, now doing it in, in brain in the brains of the animals who are alive, and 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 seeing if this occurs uh, again, and then putting the animal under anesthesia, and I would predict that under anesthesia the entanglement is reduced or inhibited or maybe blocked altogether, that the entanglement uh, requires some kind of active process, active quantum process going on in the brain. Now Alfano had a new, had a alternative, I'm not, I'm not sure it's alternative or not, uh, explanation of a quasi-particle in the brain that mediates entanglement. And uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but he, he introduced his new quantum particle as an explanation for this, and I thought it was fascinating. And I definitely look forward to more work from him, particularly on entanglement through anesthetized brains to see if it's reduced, and maybe entanglement through brains of animals who are given psychedelics. Maybe that enhances it, we'll see. Uh, again, using uh, uh, drugs like anesthesia on one side, and. Uh, psychedelics and the other to look at effects in the brain that might go down with anesthesia and go up with psychedelics. So another fascinating talk. The third talk was by Christoph Simon, a real upcoming star, I would say, in physics and quantum biology. And uh, he's at University of Calgary. And he was uh, talking about photons in the brain. It turns out that uh, there are photons produced in the brain, for example, by mitochondria, the, the energy um, factory in living cells. Now we know that uh, mitochondria make ATP, chemical en energy. It's been appreciated in the last number of years that they also produce ultraviolet photons and that these photons might be used for signaling. Now there's been a long history of, of photons in the brain, some of which has not panned out, that uh, it was kind of a byproduct of chemical processes. But there's some ideas now that, uh, that they're functional. They're produced by mitochondria and they might even trigger um, uh, uh, terahertz vibration was slightly slower. So ultraviolet is about 10 to the 15th, 10 to the 16th. These might trigger something like 10 to the 12th uh, terahertz oscillation slower in the microtubules, which then cascade to uh, uh, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz. It's kind of the, the fast under this hierarchical cascade. So again, uh, um, uh, he's thinking of looking at uh, uh, drug effects on, on uh, uh, photons in the brain, and he showed that an axon might be a good uh, waveguide, and I, I asked him about cilia, which are in all uh, cells, neurons as part of the centrioles, and in our rods and cones and our primitive visual systems, whether they may be uh, optical uh, carriers or waveguides, and uh, he's going to look into that. So that was very gratifying, and I thought it was a fascinating session. Excellent. Um, so that is a fascinating session. In there is this possibility of a new particle, a quasi-particle. That's kind of history-making, I think, maybe. It could be, but it's, it's even more amazing to think that there are 
photons in the brain that are doing something useful, that are functioning, and, and we might have an optical computer, something that, uh, that uh, technology has been striving for for many, many years. So when, as an anesthesiologist, and we say, we're going to turn your lights out, we may be speaking the truth. So that wraps Plenary 6, but uh, how about uh, Plenary 7? Plenary 7 was a two-speaker session with Paul Vershoor from Barcelona and Selene Adesoy, who's now at Oxford. Paul is a roboticist and a neuroscientist, and he builds robots and he studies the brain. He's a, he's a dual threat. He's a very talented and smart guy and uh, a very cool guy. And uh, he actually uses robot cognition to help understand the brain, and then he studies the brain to help build uh, useful robots. So he's both a theorist, an experimentalist, and a roboticist. And uh, he had a great workshop where he uh, showed films of his robots that he's built and show how they can learn and how they can uh, perform cognitive functions and how that applies to the brain. So he's, got, he's trying to set up this reverberating circuit between robots and the brain and, and, uh, and helping one uh, to understand the other and vice versa. Very interesting stuff. Selene Edesoy is a uh, neuroscientist who studies uh, the brain and uh, uh, in particular using the connectome, the, the map of the brain based on all the synaptic connections and fibers and so forth, and uh, looks for resonances in the uh, spatial domain. So, uh, so in the frequency domain, these would be frequencies, but she sees these stripes, patterns of stripes that that resonate and interact with different frequencies in the brain. And she sees the brain, uh, brain function, including uh, consciousness and cognition, more like a musical effect than, than a computation. And I agree with that completely. The more I think about it, the less I think of the brain as a computer and consciousness as a computation, but more like uh, the brain as an orchestra and consciousness as music. And her work seemed to validate this. And they had some nice interchange, and it, that was also a very good session. Excellent. And I should point out that we do have interviews both with Paul and Selen on that. Terrific. Great. Thank you, Stuart. So now um, Plenary 8. Plenary 8 was uh, Origin and Evolution of Life and Consciousness, a very uh, uh, ambitious uh, topic. And we had four speakers. And the first speaker was uh, Steen Rasmussen from uh, the University of Southern Denmark and the Santa Fe Institute. Steen is an old friend of mine and was a pioneer in the artificial life and cellular automaton movement in the 1980s, which is when I met him, and has worked uh, ever since in trying to recreate life in the laboratory, a big, ambitious uh, project, starting with the raw ingredients and the, uh, it's kind of analogous, his approach is kind of analogous to how soap gets made, where you have molecules that have a non-polar oily-like end and a polar watery-like end. And as you know, wa oil and water don't mix, so the oil-like ends stick together and the watery ends stick out. And this is called a micelle. It's kind of how soap uh, works by gl glomming on the particles. But it's, it's also a theory for the origin of cells because the interior of, of for example, of a, of a protein is nonpolar and oily due to uh, these aromatic amino acids, uh, which want to get away from water, and the water, water soluble ends stick out. So you have an entity that's uh, got uh, uh, oil-like uh, re pi resonance, it's called, in the middle, which, by the way, is conducive to quantum mechanics. And on the outside, you have uh, polar water-soluble entities, which are not. So it's a way of shielding quantum effects uh, from the environment by, by having them inside. And uh, not only proteins, but lipid membranes and uh, nucleic acids form in this way. So Steen gave a report on uh, how he's been developing life, uh, life in the laboratory, and simple minimal life, he calls it. And that was very interesting. That was followed by uh, Stuart Kaufman, who's a very well-known uh, 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 theorist uh, uh, in biology uh, on the origin and evolution of life, and his big thing is autocatalytic sets. So if, if some, think of enzymes, one enzyme catalyzes the process of another, which catalyzes another, which might catalyze its own activity, and so you build these cycles that uh, sometimes called hypercycles by Manfred Eigen, and this is how self-organization occurs. So you can start with simple molecules which catalyze their, uh, each other's activity and build very complex systems that way. So that was quite interesting, and Stuart's been talking about this uh, for a long time. Uh, the next speaker was Sarah Walker from Arizona State University, who gave a, uh, an approach to life through uh, nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory, uh, a tradition that goes back uh, many, many years. Uh, one of the uh, founders of the uh, Center for Consciousness Studies was Alwyn Scott, who's, uh, who's passed away now, and he was very influential to a lot of us. 
And uh, he wrote a book called The Stairway to the Mind, which talks about emergence, how simple systems can, um, can build up in a hierarchical layer and eventually novel properties emerge at, at the upper layer like consciousness. So that was his approach. And I think Sarah Walker would, would fall into that category. She gave a very good presentation. The final speaker was Bruce Damer, who's at UC Santa Barbara, who uh, became well known this past year or two with a, a paper in Scientific American about a new theory of the origin of life. He and his colleagues, um, rather than life emerging in the, in the oceans or in tide pools or a primordial soup, uh, they believe that life might have started in thermal vents in a very hot environment around volcanoes and so forth in a, different, a completely different type of chemistry. But the key there was alternating cycles of, of, um, of, of uh, drying and wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, so you get layering. And that can also lead into what Steen was talking about with, with nonpolar, hydrophobic, and then uh, water-soluble, oil-like, water, oil, water layers, and so forth, uh, building up uh, systems in that, in that uh, sense. And then they had a very neat, uh, nice discussion at the end. So I think it was a pretty good survey of different approaches to the origin and, and evolution of life. Of course, I brought up the possibility that consciousness may have preceded life uh, and, and actually precipitated its origin. If there was pleasure to be had, systems might have uh, originated and evolved to maximize pleasure rather than survival. But again, that's my opinion. Excellent. And uh, we were fortunate enough to have around what we call the invisible round table. It's a round table with no table with uh, Steen and Bruce and Stuart. And that went, went really well. That's in the program, sure. too. I look forward to seeing it. Great. And thank you for uh, the, uh, the Thursday wrap up, Stuart. You're very welcome. <laughs>